Right, I'd like to now call on uh, Minister Patel to share his thoughts with us, after which we will then engage in the conversation through questions. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Daryl. And may I uh, extend a, a very warm good morning uh, to uh, the organizers of the event, to members of parliament, including the Honorable Joan Fubbs, who is uh, uh, chair of the Trade and Industry Portfolio Committee, to the uh, audience uh, uh, embracing members of the diplomatic corps, as well as small businesses and large businesses that operate in the South African economy. Uh, a very warm uh, welcome to all of you. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, compete with your breakfast this morning. I know for many of you, you've had to get up very early uh, for this uh, uh, engagement. And the Progressive Business Forum breakfasts have become something of an institution. They're typically associated with the large conferences of the ANC, the ruling party, and they provide an opportunity for policymakers within the ruling party to engage with the business community, to tell our story, but also to hear some of the challenges that businesses face when they go about their day-to-day -day work. So I, I welcome uh, this opportunity to talk, uh, to make some introductory remarks, and hopefully to have a bit of a conversation. I know those of you who are uh, dedicated to the uh, PBF breakfast uh, sessions would have had the opportunity of an engagement with my colleagues uh, ministers Gigaba, Davies, and Zulu. And I have no doubt that they would have uh, sketched the macroeconomic context, they would have spoken about the importance of industrial policy, and they would have underlined why small business development is critical to our success as an economy. And so what I'd like to do today is make some contextual remarks, but specifically focus on the issue of economic inclusion. It's an issue that many South Africans are talking about in townships and in boardrooms, and it's one that the conference of uh, the ANC is grappling with uh, as it formulates not only a platform for leaders, but also a platform for policies. On the, the, the context within which I wish to make my remarks, I start off with the global economy. Uh, global growth has uh, uh, picked up uh, slightly over the last period. Uh, for this year, global growth is projected to be about 3.5%, and for next year, it's projected at 3.6%. It's what the uh, International Monetary Fund chief economist calls a firming recovery. If you recall growth rates before the global economic crisis, they were significantly higher than 3.5%. The global crisis essentially brought down possibly the structural rate of global growth. And it matters to our economy because we particularly trade exposed. One third of our GDP is generated from exports. If you look at imports as a percentage of GDP, it's an equivalent, it's also another third. So trade accounts for almost two thirds equivalent of GDP. And so when we, when we move from the big picture of the aggregates of global growth, and we look at the regional uh, performance of, of economies, Asia continues to have very high rates of growth. Uh, Europe has, has, has recovered from a long period of essentially uh, zero growth. It's now uh, modestly upped its game. Germany continues to be the most significant economy in uh, the European Union. 
And the United States, of course, uh, is promising significant expansion of investment in infrastructure. African growth, both sub-Saharan Africa as well as North Africa, uh, is projected to be somewhat lower than the historic highs that we've seen in recent years. And the reason for that essentially has to do with what's happening to global commodity markets. In the period up to 2008, we saw huge industrialization in China that created uh, an enormous appetite for South African and, in fact, global commodities. Our uh, iron ore and coal and manganese and uh, uh, other industrial products like platinum uh, were exported in, in record numbers to the rest of the world. With the global recession in 2008-2009, uh, it created uh, a, a significant challenge to demand. China stepped up to the plate and expanded their infrastructure program, which meant that demand for South African commodities continued to be high. We went through what economists would call a commodity super cycle, one of those <clears throat> perhaps once in a generation growth in demand for commodities and in the prices of commodities. As significant as the growth rate, the percentage by which people are increasing the output of goods and services in the economy, is to understand what is happening in geoeconomics. In the United States, we've seen uh, with the administration of uh, President Trump, an American first policy, a policy that seeks to redefine the United States' relationship with the rest of the world, and in that context to extract more for the United States. Uh, we've seen in Europe an inward focus, a greater uh, at attempt to reduce the flow of people coming across European borders, so immigration has become a major issue uh, in Europe, not just in the UK, where migration arguably was the single biggest uh, reason for the, uh, the vote on Brexit. But when you look at the political outcomes in Germany, in, um, in Austria, in many parts of Europe, you see a growing unease with the cost of economic openness. Uh, in in, in uh, Asia, uh, China is continuing its extraordinary levels of growth. Yes, it's come down from 10%. But growing at 6% of the much higher base means that Chinese development and China's output as a percentage of global output continues to grow. The uh, One Belt, One Road program that was announced by China reconceives of China's role for the next half century globally. As important is the shift in China's thinking about uh, uh, investment. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, China basically grew its industrial output and sold products to the rest of the world. If you look at a microphone or you look at uh, a, a notice or paper, anywhere, any product, uh, increasingly, China was expanding its output. Now China is exporting more and more capital. Chinese companies are setting up operations elsewhere in the world. They're buying operations or they're establishing new greenfields operations. And China is the big story for African investment. It's becoming by uh, growth. It's the fastest growing source of investment now on the continent. And with that, it creates new challenges, new opportunities, new dilemmas, uh, and new ways in which we, can, uh, which we can do things. So China's a big story externally. And then the final external context that I'll, I'll uh, draw attention to is an enormously important technology wave that's sweeping the world. They give it a name, the Fourth Industrial Revolution. But it's really a series of technology innovations that is redefining our world in very deep and very profound ways. Just about everything that we do <clears throat> is being reconceived as a result of this technology changes. In future, for example, 
most of you drove here to this event and uh, uh, the viewers uh, who are watching this uh, in their homes uh, across uh, South Africa uh, are getting ready to go to work now or are perhaps already at work having used either their own car or having used the taxi. Driverless cars are now in advanced uh, pilot phase in the United States. And increasingly, the model of uh, South African getting into their car, switching it on, uh, is going to be changed by this uh, shift in technology where cars essentially uh, will no longer be driven by human beings. If we look at uh, uh, South Africans and everybody here, you're eating a, a good breakfast. It's, uh, I hope, a healthy breakfast. But so much of health today is mediated by us going to our GPs and going to our physicians and our specialists. Health as a concept is being redefined through technology. And the future of health will be profoundly different with uh, wearable technologies that would uh, enable us uh, to monitor our temperatures during the day, uh, cell phones and watches that will take our pulse and our temperature and, and send us off uh, to, to central service, complex algorithms that changes the way in which we shop. And then, of course, smart uh, robotics that will increasingly do what human labor currently does. But what's important about these new technologies is the concept of, of artificial intelligence. That historically, human beings kept control of creativity and thinking. And we subcontracted the muscle work to machines. The age we live in is an age in which increasingly machines will be doing the thinking. They'll be taking enormous amounts of information, what they call big data. They'll be applying these algorithms to it to try to figure out what does this data show and how education is delivered, how uh, uh, cars or uh, food is produced, all of these will change in big ways. Turning to South Africa, we've had modest economic growth. Uh, earlier this year, the economy went into a technical recession. Uh, it emerged from that recession. Uh, but whilst growth has recovered somewhat, in the last quarter we've seen 2% growth per quarter, principally off the back of much better agricultural performance. Our growth rate remains below the level that South Africa needs to be able to create more jobs and ensure greater economic inclusion. So we've got to find ways of increasing both the rate of, uh, of, of uh, uh, economic growth as well as the level of economic inclusion. We, we challenge by rating downgrades uh, that increasingly raises concerns about uh, the price and risks of doing business in South Africa, and those rating downgrades impact on our welfare because they increase the cost of borrowing every time we borrow a billion rand, uh, either domestically or abroad, then that rating determines how much we have to pay back, the interest that is charged, but also perhaps uh, the preparedness of lenders to make money available. So we've got to get our rating, uh, ratings, our, our sovereign ratings up again. We have high levels of unemployment, even though we've, we've grown uh, the number of jobs, uh, uh, sometimes quite robustly uh, in um, uh, the period since the global economic crisis that I spoke of earlier. The economy has added two and a half million additional jobs. These are net new jobs. But at the same time, the number of young people uh, looking for work, either because they complete uh, school or college or university, or because they were previously in a rural area, uncounted, not seen as employed or unemployed, they now actively look for work, either in the rural area or uh, in South Africa's growing cities. That has meant that we need to grow our employment levels at a much higher rate than most other countries in the world. We've got to do significantly better than uh, the aggregate employment growth globally.
It may surprise many South Africans here that our job growth as a percentage has exceeded that of China in the last uh, five, six years. But because of the population pyramid, we are a young, uh, uh, we are a young population, so the demographic uh, factor, as well as, very importantly, the large numbers of people previously excluded from the notion of, uh, of employment. Uh, our, our challenges are so much higher. Having raised some of those concerns, I also want to talk about some positives. We have a very resilient democracy, uh, a, a, a parliament that increasingly holds the, the executive to account. That's a good thing because we, we public representatives uh, after all and, and, and members of parliament must hold us uh, to account. We have an independent judiciary that makes uh, decisions that the executive uh, respects, fully respects. Uh, we have a media that's free and robust. They step on toes. They, they put uh, the, the torchlight on, on what happens in the society. And they enable citizens to be informed, to know what is happening out there. Those are fundamental strengths that we have as a democracy. We're the industrial powerhouse of the African continent. We're the most diversified economic structure, deep financial markets, the continent's most advanced skills base, if you're looking for engineers or you're looking for uh, specialists in every field. South Africa has Africa's large uh, pools of talent that can be important to our own economy, but also to the growth of our continent. We deliver core services uh, on scale. Uh, if you look at uh, a telling statistic that I think, uh, in a sense, represents so much of what we do. The first electricity in South Africa was uh, connected in the year 1892. Daryl, it was even before you were born. Um, and uh, in the period from 1892 to 1996, the start of the democracy, and I use that year because the first census that we conducted in the democracy was in 1996. In that period, 5.2 million homes were connected to the electricity grid. 5.2 million. From 1996 to date, we've added an additional 10 million additional homes to the electricity grid. So in just over 20 years, we did significantly better than more than 106 years of efforts to electrify uh, homes in South Africa. And that for me is the democratic, uh, the, 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 uh, the democratic dividend that what South Africans, what citizens can expect in a democracy. And that, that storyline you will see in the delivery of housing, in the number of young people who go to schools, and the number of graduates from our universities, the connection uh, of water, all of those show the same dramatic shift in delivering services. We're on a continent with a billion people. South Africa's economy is small. Our population is small. We're now about 56 million people uh, uh, in the country. But if we can connect the 52 uh, economies on the African continent into a single uh, free trade area, we bring together a billion consumers and we create an enormous incentive for businesses to expand their investment in the continent and, in fact, indeed, in South Africa. So we've got a lot going for us. We've got a lot of challenges. And that's the complexity of modern South Africa. Uh, huge progress and big challenges. And it's against this background, then, that we say that if we are to achieve the opportunity, the promise that exists in the country, we need to do four things. We need to have a credible growth story that identifies the sectors of the economy where we can grow fast and where we can create jobs on scale and do this in a very practical way. We need to transform the economy and by transformation it means bringing young people, the energy of any nation, into the economy in larger numbers ensuring that black South Africans are part of the economy, not only 
for equity purposes, important as that is, but also because there's a compelling economic advantage to expanding the talent pool of the economy to cover every South African. It means addressing the governance challenges that we have, uh, governance challenges in state-owned companies and in the private sector, dealing with the issue of corruption, state capture, and we must talk openly about these things, and to, do, to deal with issues of corporate collusion. And uh, the challenge, I think, has been placed so starkly that we sit today uh, with a, uh, a, uh, a storyline a storyline that we can change, a storyline that on the one hand points to uh, state institutions that are currently under investigation uh, for uh, probity issues, for whether they have ensured integrity in tender processes and in how they deal with the private sector. And their issues of state capture is important. But we've also had in the private sector, for example, with the, the Steinhoff uh, uh, collapse, uh, serious questions about uh, fraud committed on scale uh, in uh, blue chip companies. We've had um, uh, allegations made against large companies uh, for seeking uh, to gain public favor uh, through inappropriate means. These are issues in a robust democracy that must be taken up. And then finally, I've spoken about the issue of a credible growth story. I've spoken about transformation and I've said governance is important. Finally, the issue of partnerships, getting South Africans, business and labor and government working much more closely to achieve higher rates of growth. So that then is the framework within which I want to focus on the specific area of economic inclusion. And economic inclusion requires a range of interventions across many platforms. It's, there are policy interventions we can do as government. Let me give you an example of procurement where the state buys its goods and services can help to create greater opportunities for economic inclusion, bringing young people and black South Africans in. Uh, it's transformation, but it's also inclusion. What we do on small business development, and I know my colleagues spoke uh, at the breakfast um, uh, recently, to ensure that uh, people who, who have passion, who have a great idea, who have the energy to see it through, but who don't have the size and perhaps the track record of having been uh, in business for a very long time, how do we create ladders of opportunity to them, giving them uh, the, the means uh, to enter the economic mainstream. So, so we need to do that and many other things. Our, our industrial policy uh, measures are also aimed at economic inclusion. But there's one fundamental challenge that we face, and that is the challenge of economic concentration. That many of our markets are characterized by very few companies dominating a particular market sector. And uh, we raised this issue uh, throughout this year as government. I highlighted it in, uh, in my budget uh, speech uh, in, in May this year. And more recently, uh, we have set out uh, a set of proposed measures of how we think we should deal with that. And that's really what I want to, to briefly uh, share uh, with, uh, uh, with the audience here today. So let me start with a problem statement uh, on, on economic concentration. The Competition Commission, who many uh, of uh, the corporates here today will be, uh, will be familiar with, uh, did a study recently where they looked at market studies conducted by companies. When a company wants to buy another company, it's called an acquisition, or when two companies want to combine ownership, it's called a merger. And when acquisitions or mergers are undertaken, normally a market study is required to show what the effect would be on, on competition. And so the Competition Commission trawled through 2,000, more than 2,000 of these uh, uh, reports, merger reports, in just about every major sector of the economy. And they, they, they tried to say, 
are these markets concentrated? Do we have very few uh, uh, players? Do we have a small number of firms that dominate those markets? And the study found that there were 294 dominant firms in defined product markets in 31 sectors uh, in the economy. And there's an international uh, standard that's used. It's called the Erfindal Hirschman Index. It's used by, among others, the United States Justice Department during their merger proceedings. And it basically measures how concentrated the market is. So let's say, for example, you've got a thousand firms, each having something like 0.01% uh, uh, of a market then your index would be zero. In other words, it would be a highly competitive market. There would be absolutely no concentration. If you had one firm controlling 100% of uh, the market, it would be uh, an index score of 10,000. So in other words, it's perfect monopoly. Now, in most economies, of course, it varies somewhere in between those. So we use the, uh, the, the scale, the... Um, <coughs> Uh, uh, the uh, Erfindal Hirschman scale and looked at a number of sectors of the economy. And we found a number of markets that would be regarded as highly concentrated, where the score is more than 2,500. They included sectors such as communication technologies, energy, financial services, food and agro processing infrastructure and construction, intermediate industrial products, mining, pharmaceuticals, and transport. So what we were able to establish of the factual base is there are, that those markets would be regarded on an international standard, a standard economic measure, as highly concentrated. What does concentration mean, though? What is the impact of concentration? Concentration can potentially have negative effects. Uh, it can raise prices, so you've got too little competition and the critical means of lowering prices and protecting uh, customers uh, is, is, is uh, removed. It can result in lower economic growth. It can stunt innovation and investment. If you've already got a dominant share in the market, there's less incentive for you to take some of the the profits that a company generates and reinvest it in innovation. And of course, it's associated with higher levels of inequality. Above all, concentrated markets has the challenge that it can lead to economic exclusion. That it's harder for a young person or a small business to break into a market that is highly concentrated and where the established players have had a history of dominating that market. So why not simply prohibit concentration? Why not just pass the law that say all markets must be deconcentrated? Part of the reason why we've decided not to go that route is that economic concentration at times uh, may be a necessary feature of a market. It may be a necessary feature of a market in those examples where uh, you need huge production runs to be able to be in that sector, either because of price uh, issues that you're only able to achieve the economies of scale uh, with large production runs, or because the, uh, the capital needs are so high that only one player uh, may find opportunity in the market in a very large economy like the United States economy or the Chinese economy, you can combine economies of scale. You can be a very big company without being dominant in that economy because of the sheer size of that uh, economy. In a small economy like South Africa, if you're a very large company, it often is associated with economic concentration because the market is small. So if you're a large player, you tend to dominate uh, a small <clears throat> domestic market like South Africa. Secondly, if we want South African companies 
to be out there active, rolling up their sleeves, getting into exporting to the rest of the continent, becoming, uh, some people call them national champions, uh, the Samsung of South Korea uh, equivalent in South Africa, the General Motors of the United States equivalent uh, uh, in South Africa. If we want South African companies to be able to compete in global markets and particularly uh, on uh, uh, the rest of African markets, then they need to be large companies. They can't be only small businesses. In a world in which technology is so fundamentally reshaping our economies, you need companies with deep pockets that, is, that are able to mobilize the resources for innovation. So those and other reasons show that it's more complex, that concentration is not something that you can always avoid. There may be a necessary feature of a market. And so we've got to navigate this area. On the one hand, recognizing the costs of economic concentration. On the other hand, recognizing economic reality in certain kinds of markets where economic concentration may be the inevitable outcome. So how does government then deal with that? Our starting point is that deconcentration in the economy is an important means of promoting economic inclusion. So our policy preference is very clear, that we seek to deconcentrate markets, that we, we seek to open up opportunities for more South Africans. And it's not only in give uh, black South Africans 10% shareholding or 15% shareholding, it's increasing the number of enterprises in a market, bringing more players in, uh, allowing black-owned companies to be players in the market, allowing enterprises run by young people to be uh, producers of goods or services in the market. And that's the challenge that we face, it's a challenge that is particularly acute in South Africa given our history, but it's a challenge when I speak to policymakers elsewhere in the world that many countries are grappling with, how to increase levels of economic inclusion. And let me do a little, uh, uh, a little uh, uh, diversion. The cost of not dealing with economic inclusion is very high for every society. Not only in growth foregone, but in a deep frustration uh, with, economic, uh, with the economic order. I recently had uh, Professor Joseph Stiglitz, an economic laureate, a uh, Nobel laureate, uh, uh, visit South Africa and he addressed a, a symposium of South African uh, uh, businesses, uh, uh, trade unionists and government officials uh, that are convened uh, at uh, uh, the University of uh, Witwatersrand. And he gave us uh, his take on, on developments in the United States and he said that the failure of government policies to ensure proper economic inclusion has contributed to a mood, to an atmosphere that um, uh, then candidate Trump was able to tap into and that has uh, resulted in an administration that is following the policies uh, that the world looks at uh, with, with deep concern. Uh, he pointed to Brexit and the, the European Union that increasingly, because people feel that those economies, though they are growing, they're not providing opportunities uh, for, for local people and for local players. People are turning uh, against openness. And if we want economies that are open, if we want economies that trade with each other, if we see the importance of uh, uh, exchanging the best that humanity can offer across national borders, then we have to address the issues of economic inclusion. Coming back to South Africa then, how do we then uh, deal with this, this challenge of economic inclusion. So what we've done is we've published a bill in the Government Gazette uh, uh, a few weeks ago. We're inviting you as, as uh, businesses to, to read the bill. It's a relatively easy read. Uh, it's available on the Gazette. Uh, we are prepared to make it available to companies and to individuals. Uh, if you provide uh, the, uh, the hosts of today's event with your, your business cards, then uh, we can make sure that you get emailed copies of, of the bill and the explanatory memorandum. And what it essentially says is we're going to expand the power and the mandate of the competition authorities. 
that part of what they will look at in future is economic concentration. At the moment, the mandate of the competition authorities is they look at mergers and acquisitions and they check the competition impact and the public interest impact if one company buys another company. They also look at abuse of dominance. Are you doing something as <clears throat> uh, the major player that uh, undermines the possibility of new entrants or your competitors staying in business? And I should point for reasons of transparency that the uh, sponsors of this morning's breakfast is currently uh, before the competition tribunal. They are arguing their case and the competition commission is arguing its case. And that is how it should work in a democracy, uh, that people have the right of reply. But we're looking at uh, a case of uh, uh, abuse of dominance involving uh, that company. Uh, and, and the competition authorities have been reasonably successful in dealing with mergers and dealing with issues of cartels, abuse of dominance, and so on. But that goes to the question of behavior. More and more policymakers here and elsewhere are saying, what about economic structure? What if a market is so dominated by, small, by, by a few uh, players that others can't come in? And so what we've done is instead of going uh, the sledgehammer route of uh, passing a law that would prohibit economic concentration, because I've, as I've said earlier, we've got to balance the, the issues of uh, the costs, and the potential necessity in a small market like South Africa, what, we, what we're putting up is uh, an opportunity for the competition authorities to conduct market inquiries in which they look at the sector, they determine the level of economic concentration. So in other words, they look at the facts, at the evidence. They provide companies with an opportunity to come forward and say, yes, our market is concentrated, but these are the reasons. Or they could uh, say, no, our market is not concentrated. Your information is wrong. This is why we believe it's a competitive market. And then what the competition authorities will do, they will determine whether those markets where you have economic concentration, whether it has a negative impact on competition, the entry of black South Africans to the economy, and the impact on small businesses. If they find it has no negative impact on competition, uh, the entry of black South Africans, uh, the operation of small businesses, then of course they will leave it. If they find that it has a negative impact on competition and the entry of, uh, uh, of a greater number of South Africans into the economy, including and particularly black South Africans, then they will be entitled uh, to put remedies in place. Companies in turn will have the opportunity to go to the competition tribunal and uh, appeal against those remedies that the competition authorities will put in place. Now I've dealt with what are really the nuts and bolts of a piece of law. Let me say the significance of that. What it does, it will put the focus on manageable, economically sensible ways of deconcentrating the economy, opening up opportunity, providing access to more South Africans, at the same time not clumsily seeking to interfere with uh, how corporates conduct their businesses when there's no economic or social rationale to do so. So we recognize that we have a challenge, but we also recognize that if we don't deal with this challenge uh, at all, then more and more frustration will grow with economic exclusion, with people who are left without jobs, without entrepreneurial opportunity. We recognize at the same time that if we, if we come in with clumsy and inappropriate uh, uh, regulatory interventions, we may stunt the growth of businesses and the economic uh, growth that goes with it the fiscal revenue that's generated, the jobs that can be created when larger South African companies begin to employ many more people and export their products to the rest of the world. So we're trying to find that careful balance. And I think you will be, uh, you will be very interested when you read the bill to see how we've struck that balance. What is not negotiable for us 
is that we must have a more inclusive economy. Economic inclusion is critical. What's also not negotiable for us is we've got to increase the rate of growth. The economy is not growing fast enough. And even though we've avoided a deep and damaging recession this year, our growth rate continues to be below that of population growth. And we've got to at least achieve uh, a growth rate higher than the population growth so that every South African can grow uh, more prosperous and better off each year as the economy grow in an inclusive way. There are other changes that we've made in the uh, Competition Act that um, you will no doubt have an opportunity to look at. And uh, it's an invitation not just to the corporates here today, but to all South Africans to comment on the law. And we, we have a period until the end of January for public comment on uh, the Competition Amendment Bill. Now, I've raised the issue of economic concentration, but I should highlight that we've also had successes in dealing with it using the existing tools. And I want to cite very briefly three examples. Example one is in the beverages industry, where we concluded two large uh, mergers uh, uh, over the last uh, 12, uh, 14 months. The one is uh, involving uh, soft drinks, the Coca-Cola company. The other one uh, uh, involving uh, alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages, uh, SAB Miller. In the case of Coca-Cola, through engagement with the company and utilizing the provisions of the Competition Act, the companies agreed uh, to increase the level of black economic empowerment from 11% to 30%. So that's a significant increase in the level of equity that black South Africans will have in uh, a product that notwithstanding the, uh, the sugar tax uh, that's coming next year, uh, many, many South Africans consume regularly. The iconic uh, uh, South African uh, brand, Apple Ties and Grape Ties, for the first time now has uh, uh, embraced uh, BEE partners. They've got two BEE players that together uh, own 20% of, 21% of the equity of Apple Ties. I met them recently uh, in a small little town uh, in the Western Cape. Uh, where the bottling of apple ties had take place. And one of the, the uh, BEE players uh, told me his life story. He started as a cleaner in um, uh, the company, and today he's a shareholder in the company. So th there's an example of economic transformation, practical, clear, and done in a way that the corporates can see the, the value of doing the right thing. Second example involves... Um, the steel industry. And last year we imposed the largest ever fine uh, against a single company in South African corporate history, a 1.5 billion rand fine against ArcelorMittal uh, for uh, practices, uh, including uh, being part of a cartel and in our view uh, being guilty of uh, abuse of dominance. Uh, but not only did they pay a very high fine, they've also undertaken a process of transformation where they're bringing more black South Africans into, uh, into the company. But we've taken a portion of that fine and we've created a 1.5 billion rand steel development fund to support smaller players in the steel industry, to bring more South Africans into steel making and to the use of raw steel and transforming it into products in the economy. That same company we've uh, 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 through agreement with, with the company, we've got a price cap uh, where for the next five years they are limited because they're essentially an upstream monopoly. They're limited on uh, the level of price increases because that's critical to our competitiveness. If raw steel is expensive, then the beneficiation of that raw steel will be off a high cost basis. Uh, and, and finally, uh, they, they've, they've also agreed that they're going to invest more. And therein lies our challenge, that unless companies invest uh, significantly in upgrading plant and equipment, uh, the only way in which they can cling onto their market share is colluding with each other. And so this company will be investing 4.6 billion rand in upgrading uh, and modernizing its factories. So that's the second example. Third example is the construction industry. 
And in the construction industry, it started off with a, an unhappy story uh, during the 2010 World Cup where there was evidence of uh, uh, companies uh, coordinating their prices, what we call corporate collusion. They paid a fine of 1.4 billion rand uh, to the competition authorities. Uh, they, paid a sub, uh, they committed to a subsequent 1.5 billion rand additional payment uh, to try to promote uh, development more generally. But there was also a bold decision that those companies took, that they're going to transform. They're going to transform their ownership structures, and they're going to embrace black construction companies as their partners and work with black construction companies to expand turnover of some of those black construction companies significantly. I know um, there's at least one member of the audience uh, uh, here today who comes uh, from uh, that sector and who may want to say a word or two uh, about uh, her own experience. It's a, it's a, it's a, 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 a female entrepreneur uh, who runs a construction business and who is a partner as a result of this construction transformation. So I've given these three examples to show that when you go beyond the rhetoric, when we engage companies, increasingly corporate South Africa recognizes that there's a need for change. Increasingly, government is saying that the pace of, scale, uh, the pace of change needs to be stepped up, that we've got to build this inclusive economy that everybody feels there's a space for them and that economic inclusion is going to be a critical driver of all of our efforts. And that brings me then to the conversation this morning, the partnership that we need to forge between government, small business and large businesses, but also between businesses and their own workers, the trade union movement. Is the time not ripe for us to rethink some of our own uh, stakeholder models? Uh, should we not get workers to be greater equity holders in companies and have worker representatives on the boards of companies? Germany defeated at the end of uh, the Second World War. Much of its industrial uh, capacity bombed to pieces by a carpet bombing campaign in the, in the last year of the war had to find a new road to economic recovery. And they built that road on partnership. They embraced a partnership involving uh, business and labor. Government played a, a positive, constructive role, but the key players were workers and entrepreneurs. And they, they provided a model uh, uh, a co-determination model, they called it, that enabled workers to be on the board of companies. Today, Germany remains one of the most competitive industrial economies in the world with high levels of flexibility, uh, innovation, and, uh, and, and, and quality products through that partnership. Japan, a, com a country equally devastated by the, uh, by the Second World War, remember two nuclear bombs, the only nuclear bombs ever dropped in anger, uh, were dropped uh, on <clears throat> Japan. They entered into a partnership between business and labor uh, that spawned the concept of lifelong employment for the salary men, for the, uh, the core workers in the Japanese economy. And ordinary workers, whether it was at a company like Toyota or wherever, felt that they needed to constantly make contributions to improving the competitiveness of their companies. Today, Japan is one of the large economies of the world. They've more than recovered from the damage of the past. Uh, they're an affluent society built on a model of partnership. South Africa's got challenges, and as I've said, we've got some enormous strengths too. One of the things that we, we utilized in our, in our political transition was the ability to talk to each other and to reach bold agreements, to avoid the second road, the road of ruin, of uh, an ongoing civil war between black South Africans and white South Africans. We found uh, a, a formula for the democracy. Yes, it's a, it's a noisy democracy. Yes, people will bicker with each other. But it's a democracy, it's a resilient democracy. 
we need to now see whether we can take that same strength of, uh, of national character, that same can-do attitude that South Africans uh, have demonstrated in many other areas and do it in the economy and say, we're going to grow this economy and we're going to grow it uh, in inclusive ways. We're going to give more South Africans opportunities. That's why I'm here to talk to you. That's why 5,000 delegates are out there next door debating policy, thinking about issues, reflecting on who should lead the ruling party over the next five years and who should inspire policies uh, in, in government. And that's why all 55 million, 56 million South Africans are so important. We need their ideas. And that's why small businesses, large businesses, trade unions, all of the, the key economic players are so critical to our thinking. So I'm looking forward to an engagement with you, not only today, but in many other sessions where we will have an opportunity to talk to particular industries. So thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to say a few words. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. I think uh, you have to agree that uh, this was a comprehensive, insightful, and highly informative contribution to uh, our dialogue. Thank you so much for that. Now, uh, this is uh, the conversation, so if, uh, if you could just give me an indication as to who... Well, that's the PBA.